Marcus, to you. Welcome back uh, to the session. I'm sorry that we've incurred a delay. Uh, we had a few uh, quite difficult discussions in the committee, uh, which uh, we couldn't postpone. Uh, so sorry about being late. Uh, let's uh, now go to the presentation of uh, Run Group B that will be given by Silvia Nicolai. Please, Silvia. Hello, good evening. I'm going to uh, present you uh, the class of Run Group B, which uh, con uh, comprises experiment doing electro production on a deuterium target with class 12. I will give uh, an overview of the physics goal of the Run Group together, uh, detail which uh, experiments compose the Run Group, mention what happened during the data taking that we had during 2019 and uh, provide analysis updates, preliminary results, uh, and then uh, proceed with the beam time request. All this will be done with uh, in mind the three questions that the PAC asked us. Uh, namely, I will try to provide any new information affecting the impact of the experiment and uh, the experiments composed in the run group. And um, as we already took a portion of the allocated time, I will provide an analysis of the existing data some projected results uh, and show the impact of um, what the additional bin time uh, that uh, we uh, we need uh, will provide. And uh, as far as the third question, I can anticipate that we are not uh, asking uh, changes in the bin time allocation nor in the experiment grade. So uh, providing a multidimensional mapping of nucleon structure is uh, one of the core um, items of program of the 12 GV upgrade of Jefferson Lab. And we know that uh, there are three main degrees of freedom in play in, in, uh, at play in describing the partonic uh, dynamics of the nucleon. And this is the, the transverse position of the parton, its transverse momentum and the longitudinal momentum. And uh, in order to access this degree of, degrees of freedom, there is a set of uh, uh, distributions that are experimentally accessible, and these are the form factors, the PDFs, the GPDs, and the TMDs. They are accessible in different uh, uh, final states, and uh, they give access to different combination of the degrees of freedom of the partons. And the main goal of uh, RAN Group B is to measure all this distribution using the deuterium as a neutron target. And one of the goals is to uh, operate a quark flavor separation of these structure functions, uh, combining with the proton results for this distribution. On top of that, we also have other experiments, uh, such as the ones investigating EMC effect and short-range coloration, or J-side protoproduction on deuterium. The complete uh, list of the experiment of the RAN group is shown here. We have uh, eight experiments so far. Four of them are PAC approved, all with A or A minus rating, and four of them are run group additions that came afterwards. There is one high impact uh, experiment that was awarded the 90 days um, of running, and this is the one on which I will spend some more time. It's the deeply virtual Compton scattering on the neutron. So uh, the run group B had uh, uh, some time of running during uh, 2019 and the beginning of 2020. We had uh, 86 uh, calendar days uh, divided in three periods. The one that we call the spring period, uh, February, March, uh, and fall in December, and the winter period. We had as a setup the baseline class 12 setup uh, and uh, a deuterium target, the forward tagger, one sector of the reach, and we had two dedicated neutron detectors that were built for this experiment. The central neutron detector for the uh, neutron DVCS experiment and the, back and the backward neutron detector for the short range correlation experiment. During this uh, run, we collected uh, a bit more than 40 billion triggers. And uh, this happened with three different values of the beam energy due uh, to uh, problems with the CBAF accelerator. Namely, during the spring uh, data taking, we had uh, half of the data taking was 10.6 uh, uh, GV beam energy and the other half with 10.2 GV beam energy. 
And then in the fall, uh, the accelerator could uh, reach only 10.4 GV. And uh, uh, we had one data set taken without bending um, total settings, while the other data taken were done with in-bending settings. Uh, in total, according to ABUs, we collected about 39 PAC days, which correspond to 43% of the approved 90 days that were awarded to the NDVCS experiment. So we have 51 pack days that are left to run, and this is what we ask to the PAC to accord us. Uh, the data that were taken are being processed. And uh, uh, as it was the first uh, data taken, we had more time to devote to the spring data set, which has been calibrated. And we just completed the, the, um, the reconstruction procedure at the beginning of September. And uh, the, the results I will present in this presentation come all from the spring data set and correspond to roughly 50% of the data taken so far. The other two periods are undergoing uh, calibrations, and we are about to start reconstruction for the full data set. I will first focus on the NDVCS experiment, neutral DVCS experiment, which was awarded um, the label of high impact by the PAC back in 2011 when it was proposed. Um, we, uh, as we know, the, uh, the GPDs are uh, uh, depend on the flavor of the quark. So if uh, we want to achieve um, the separation in flavors of, of the quark of the GPD, we need to combine results uh, obtained uh, from the proton and the neutron target. This is one of the reasons why we're interested in NDVCS. But there is a, an extra interest in, the, in this particular experiment that aims to extract the bin spin asymmetry for NDVCS because this observable is the most sensitive to the GPDE, and the GPDE is uh, vital for the measurement of the GSM rule to extract the quark's angular momentum, and it's also the least known nowadays and the least constrained. In fact, there are two observables, DVCS observables, that are sensitive to uh, E. One is the B at bin spin asymmetry, for the neutron, and one is the transversely polarized target asymmetry for the proton, which is equally sensitive to the H and the uh, E GPD. And so far, there are no data that were taken at Jefferson Lab uh, with the transversely polarized target, and data from Hermes had very poor statistical precision. So the, the, the motivation for the high impact label for this experiment is, uh, is its sensitivity to the GPD. Uh, this observable, the bin spin asymmetry, is very um, dependent on the kinematics according to models, so it's important to measure it over a wide the kinematical coverage, which is the case of class 12. And uh, um, we need, uh, of course, uh, in principle, uh, uh, more bin time because the cross section for this uh, reaction is uh, quite small. Uh, one of the questions of the PAC is uh, what is the status, uh, what happened since the experiment was proposed. The, propose, the proposal came up in 2011 and was inspired by the, um, the result that you, show, you, you see on the left of this slide. It was the first pioneering experiment of NDVCS done in OLA at 6 GeV. And uh, this experiment uh, measured um, uh, the final state with an electron and the photon only on a deuteron target and uh, extracted a convolution of the neutron and uh, the coherent deuterium DVCS uh, by subtracting uh, hydrogen uh, data from the deuterium data. And um, this first experiment had uh, uh, big uh, uncertainties both uh, on the and, um, statistical and the systematic uh, level, uh, but uh, it was very important because it pointed to the importance of this observable and uh, achieved a first model-dependent uh, extraction of JUJD. Followed uh, after this experiment uh, that was done at one kinematic point in Q square and X, uh, there was another analysis that was recently published by Olay uh, of 6GV data. And uh, this uh, uh, experiment was done in the same way with the same subtraction procedure to extract uh, uh, the convolution of uh, neutron and deuterium DVCS uh, 
and uh, via uh, uh, some kinematic constraints and fits, they operated uh, a separation of the neutron and deuterium components uh, that you see here with the, purple, uh, the, the pink and the blue bands. Uh, with high uh, systematic uncertainties, but still it uh, was important because pointed uh, to the first observation of non-zero cross-section for the DVC and DVCS uh, process. So these results uh, um, mark uh, the importance for, uh, for this channel for uh, the physics of GPD and for its sensitivity to E, but also show how important it is to make a dedicated NDVCS experiment with neutron detection to avoid the problem of the convolution between the new and the deuterium uh, coherent process. And wide coverage is needed. This experiment was performed as a single, at a single Q-square point at low Q-square. So here comes uh, the uh, experiment we took with RGB for NDVCS. This is the first time that uh, uh, the bin spin asymmetry for NDVCS is measured with an exclusive finite state detection because we had uh, the neutron detection detector that was added, the central neutron detector was added to class 12 for this experiment. So we have a fully exclusive selection of the final state that allows us to apply a set of co a combination of uh, exclusivity cuts and cleanly select uh, the final state. Here down you see the Q-square and XBRCAN distribution of the selected NDVCS events uh, compared to the, the, uh, the point that was measured in the OLA at 6 GB. We have obtained about, uh, uh, analyzing the spring data, which is 50% of the data we have now, we have 55,000 NDVCS events candidates. And you can see here a preview of our uh, bin spin asymmetry. Uh, it's a raw asymmetry without background subtraction yet, but still, it gives you, um, we can see the signal, we see the expected uh, sinus phi uh, distribution. And um, this uh, is done combining um, all the kinematics, uh, all the detection topologies, and combining the data taken at 10.6, at 10.2 GV, which uh, uh, in an ideal world should not be done because uh, uh, the beta Hitler cross section has a different dependency as a function of the energy. But uh, given our statistics right now, that's all we could do. And there is, of course, work ongoing on the pi zero subtraction, fiducial cuts. This is only a very uh, preliminary result, but uh, gives you an idea of um, what we can achieve and the current statistical precision. Uh, this statistical precision allows us only so far to make uh, one-dimensional bins uh, for this asymmetry. So here, each line represents distribution as a function of one of the kinematic variables. We have Q square here, three bins, three bins in minus T, and we managed to do uh, four bins in XBRCAN. What we can see from here, we, we see the size of the asymmetry, which is very small, it's of the level of 5%. The error bars at this stage are pretty big. And um, still, uh, it's, a, it's a first time uh, uh, observation of, uh, of this asymmetry. And uh, we have uh, produced the projections using this data to give uh, a sense of the, um, of the precision we can achieve by receiving the full 90 days for the experiment. We used the, the yield experimental that we get right now with this data uh, per each uh, three-dimension bin in this case, actually four-dimension because we have phi and Q square, T and X. Each page here is a different bin in T. So we took this yield and uh, the red bar represent what we will get uh, analyzing all the existing data that we have right now in RGP and the blue bars, what we expect if we get the 90 path days that we were approved for. We have assumed here a constant 5% sinus phi amplitude for the asymmetry and use this formula for the calculation of the error bars. So as you see, with the data that we have right now, we have a relative error that exceeds 100% in most of the kinematics. And especially bad the situation at IQ square and the low T, High T here, we have integrated over all that's left, but the low T has pretty bad error bars. And this is a region that is very interesting and 
um, crucial for uh, the GPDs. We want to be at high Q square and low, uh, low T for the GSAM rule. So uh, we consider it crucial to complete the data taking for this experiment. And no, part of the, yeah. yes, okay, part of the experiment uh, proposed also to um, the, the original proposal we proposed to measure the proton DVCS in deuterium because it's necessary to have this measurement in order to assess uh, the impact of final state interaction on the NDVCS measurement. And the idea here, we are going to extract bin spin asymmetry also for the proton DVCS for uh, in the bound, uh, um, bound proton DVCS, compare it uh, to the bin spin asymmetry from hydrogen data from RGA and uh, uh, obtain uh, with this the, the impact that um, an state interaction can have. For the proton DVCS extraction that is uh, done in a similar way to the NDVCS extraction, we have about 2 million PDVCS candidates. And this is um, the, the asymmetry that we can observe uh, is compatible in size with the uh, bin spin asymmetries obtained in RGA. And the yields are scaling as expected, uh, comparing NDVCS and PDVCS, considering cross sections and efficiency. This is also an um, ongoing uh, uh, work uh, with uh, background subtraction and fiducial cuts may be done, but uh, I'm showing here. Each page is a different T bin, and uh, we have uh, uh, a nice binning in Q square uh, X and T, which uh, can help us uh, to operate uh, a tomography of um, of the proton uh, embedded in the deuteron. So this will be also a first time measurement that RGB data can allow us, and uh, of course uh, statistics is necessary also for this for this measurement. Uh, changing subject, another proposal that composes the RAN group is the one um, aiming to extract the neutral magnetic four factor uh, GM at IQ square with the, the method based on taking a ratio between the quasi elastic EN and the quasi elastic EP cross sections on the deuteron. You see here the status of the current existing measurements, the black and gray plot points are the ones that this experiment can achieve depending on the runtime. The other world data are uh, having with decent uh, precision up to let's say 4 GV or a bit less and then precision is very bad and the coverage stops around 10 GV. So um, with RGB and with the 90 days RGB will extend the uh, reach of the current data for GMN where there are no data yet and uh, will give high precision allowing to discriminate uh, theoretical models. The analysis status is that uh, um, channel selection is ongoing with RGB data. We see here an example of how the quasi-elastic EP events can be selected uh, by kinematic cuts. cuts in parallel, in order to have control on the efficiency, which is very important for the ratio of cross-section, RGA data uh, are being used to extract the neutron detection efficiency using the EP, EPI plus N channel. And you see here uh, a distribution where the red points show the efficiency measured with class 12 and the black point the same measurement, but done using class data. So this analysis is in good progress. Uh, passing to CDIS, uh, another experiment that will provide first time uh, measurement is uh, the dihadron multiplicity measurement. Here the, um, the observable is defined as a ratio of the cross section for the production of uh, two hadrons. In our case, it's gonna be pi plus and pi minus normalized to the DIS cross section. And the dihadron cross-section is proportional to the dihedron unpolarized fragmentation function, which uh, uh, is the main goal of this experiment. And uh, uh, the combination of hydrogen and deuteron data for the multiplicity of dihedron allows to separate the quark flavor dependence of the, um, of the fragmentation function. So here- You have about a, one minute left, Silvia. I'm sorry, uh, dihadron multiplicities here shown 
for uh, uh, RGA data and deuterium data in a four-dimensional analysis for one given Q square beam. So what uh, uh, if we uh, get the full uh, 90 days of the experiment, uh, this statistics is going to be uh, multiplied by roughly between four and factor four and five. And this will improve the sensitivity, especially in the high Q square region, because here you see a bin at low Q square, but the situation in terms of statistics is worse at high Q square. And there is in the backup, there is an example of this. And uh, this will give us better precision in the extraction of the um, down quarks uh, fragmentation function because the deuterium data dominate uh, in that uh, term. And uh, we can add the PT uh, dependence, uh, access, giving us access to TMDs. Another important experiment of the RAN group is the JPSI uh, photo production on deuterium. And uh, re replying to your questions, uh, uh, the impact of the experiment is as high as when it was proposed because uh, one of the goal of the experiment is to measure the PC uh, pentaquark in photo production. And uh, given the negative results from all D and C on the proton channel, it's critical to do the measurement uh, with the neutron. And also, this is the only experiment uh, measuring uh, this um, exclusive uh, uh, final state uh, worldwide and uh, also the coherent final state. So, uh, looking at the data that we took uh, with the spring uh, 2019, uh, here there is a spectrum of the E plus uh, E minus, and we see the bump corresponding to the J psi, where we have estimated about 450 events. Uh, considering the energy um, that we had in the spring, basically we have only 11% of the required 90 days uh, that were taken with this data for the pentaquark study. And for the JPSI coherent and incoherent, we have about 22% because of the shape of the energy distribution. So it's crucial to complete the experiment uh, for this particular channel, especially uh, doing it at high energy. And uh, uh, finally, uh, there is the experiment to study the, uh, the proton structure in deuterium by tagging uh, backwards nucleon, neutrons with the band experiment. This experiment aims to extract a ratio of the bound F2 structure function over the free uh, structure function. And uh, again, in this case, uh, this ratio is proportional to a ratio of the um, yields taken at high X with the ones taken at low X. And um, unless we get the 90 days, especially the IX distribution you see here, uh, these are the yields we expect uh, as a function of alpha uh, and uh, X prime. Uh, we won't be able to really discriminate the models at I alpha unless we get the full statistical power of the experiment. So I'm getting to my conclusions. Um, the quark flavor separation and the 3D extraction of the neutron are the goals of this uh, run group, which ran uh, roughly 43% in uh, uh, 2019 uh, with three different beam energies. The status of the analysis is in good shape for several channels. There are channels that I couldn't uh, uh, discuss, but they are in the backup. Uh, new measurements, uh, for instance, the, the coherent uh, uh, DVCS on deuteron and the DVMP for pi zeros in the neutron, which were uh, mentioned by the, the TAC uh, as important uh, new results. The analysis of KCDs is in progress, but first they are focusing on RGA uh, analysis, so I don't have results so far. We request the PAC to allow us to run the leftover 51 days of our bin time. And uh, this way, we will be able to measure the wind spin asymmetry of NDVCS in four dimensional dimensions with acceptable statistics. And in this way, really exploiting the potential of class 12 and the available phase space. And we will be able to deliver the physics that we had proposed in the experiment and give constraints to the GPDE, which remains unknown. We also will extend at IQ square the coverage for GMN, where there are no other data. For KC, this, this, the fact that we will run when there will be the two rich sectors will provide uh, three times the statistic as what we have now. We'll also be uh, do a first-time measurement of diadron multiplicities 
and extract the dihydron fermentation function separating U and D quartz uh, contribution. First time measurement of JPSI photo production and deuterium, which the current data don't allow us to perform, and made uh, a multidimensional study of short range correlation with bound neutron and first time measurement for new channels, uh, neutron DVCS and DVMP on the neutron. Thank you, and excuse me for running late. Thank you. Uh, the reader of this experiment is Feng Yuan. Uh, Feng, please, uh, can you ask your questions? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, so very, the very nice presentation. Um, I'm very impressed by the DVCS analysis so far and also the project plan. That's a beautiful result. Uh, I have a couple questions. So, <clears throat> so you, you mentioned about the chip side. I would assume that the GLUX measurement uh, uh, results really have negative impact on your plan uh, uh, rather than the uh, other way around. Uh, my, my question is that uh, how you compare to GLUX? So how many events they have and how many events you expected? And uh, wh wh why you say this actually is uh, critical? Okay, for this, uh, I would, uh, if uh, if they are around, I would uh, have the uh, spokespersons of this experiment reply on my behalf. Uh, Jordan, are you around? They know it more precisely. Or Stefan? Jordan, I mean, I don't have the, the, the this information personally, but uh, the spokesperson should be around no Stefan is on yes Jordanka Stefan he doesn't hear me they're on as attendees yes they have to be promoted or... oh I I thought <coughs> okay Jordanka no, Jordanka I, I gave her the um, this the link for the speakers oh there is maybe a chat. I, ah, okay. Stepan, can you comment on the pentaquark? She's asking. Oh, you can write it in chat. Uh, um, oh, Stepan says nobody can hear him. Uh, did you turn on your mic, Stepan? Mic seems to be on. Okay. Or I can promote people to speakers, they say. He's a presenter. Promoted your Danka, but there's a delay to your Danka, you're promoted. Go for it. Jordanka? There's a delay in the time that she comes over. Ah, okay. Maybe Stepan can write text and we can read that. I'm sorry, I prefer not to say if I'm not, um, I mean, I'm not as competent as them on this field. So. Meanwhile, yeah, Feng, if you have any other, Feng, if you have any other question, maybe you can ask. Yeah, that let's uh, let's have other questions, maybe. Okay, so so the the last part you you talk uh, you mentioned about the bound unbound uh, the the structure. Uh, how is this compared to to EMC measurement? This uh, yeah. this experiment. Uh, in what sense, how does it compare? I don't think that there is a, a measurement in these conditions with the tag the backwards neutron. I understand. So that, that's one of my questions. So, so I mean, EMC effects are doing, uh, uh, I mean, at least uh, for the short range correlation uh, interpretation for the EMC effects, uh, they are doing, uh, 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 the the target the the end the goal is the same right so how uh, my question how you compare with uh, traditional EMC effects 
merriment. Or the goal is to clarify some issue for the EMC effects. Yeah, I mean, the way I understood is that uh, uh, the idea is to compare with different models of the EMC effect and take the ratio of this quantity as um, the ratio of the bound F2 over the free F2 as a function of different kinematics. And then there will be different models explaining, uh, uh, interpreting the EMC effect. That is what uh, I was um, I was told about this experiment. I mean, my experiment is NDVCS. So, so, uh, so, so, so the, the, yes. the three curves in your curve uh, represents three different models. Three different me. models, yes. This is the straight one, and these are different predictions. I understand. So okay. these three curves give the same explanation for the EMC effects? I just say that uh, Oren yes. made comments in the chat. Oh, yeah. is, Oren, is Oren online? He is chatting. I, I, okay. okay, there you go. EMC is inclusive. Okay, there you go. Averaging over all the nucleons in the nucleus, what we are doing here is focusing on high momentum, high virtuality nucleons. We are examining the underlying cause of the effect. He can't speak, but we see what you're writing. Or Thank you all. There you go. Yeah. So you don't have any questions on DVCS? Okay. Yeah, I think DVCS is very clear. Uh, the Pentaclock, nobody comments on this? What was the question? Maybe I could say something. But... Okay, so my question is that, that GuruX have published results. Right. Oh, there he is. Yeah. Stepan is writing. Complementary to this measurement in all the, the statistics to be comparable to GLUEX, but the goal of the OLD experiment is not only measure the cross section or, or search for LHCB pentaquark state, but also study rescattering effect in JPSI production. Okay. You happy so with the that? statistics? Sorry? Are you happy with that thing? Yeah, kind of. I, okay. I, I, I just have a general uh, kind of concern about it because GRUX didn't fund it, so um, I, I don't I don't see strong motivation to go after with neutron tag. I'm fine with it now. There is not okay. only the pentaquark study as a goal of this experiment, there is also the JPSI uh, coherent and incoherent measurement. So it's not only geared on the pentaquark search, the proposal. Yeah, it's a third of the physics goal, the pentaquark. As okay, um, Ping, do you have any other question? No, I'm done. Thank you very much. Unless there is an urgent question from anyone else on the PAC, I uh, suggest we thank Silvia and go to the next you, speaker. Marco Contalvigo will uh, give us an update on run group H. Please, Marco. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Are you? Uh, ah, start sharing. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Can you hear me and see the slides? Yes, we see the slides now full screen and we hear you. You're ready to go. Very good. So <clears throat> I'm going to report about uh, a run group H of class 12 that collects uh, experiments with a transversely polarized target. Uh, there are three of them uh, that were approved in to, uh, 2012. Two, uh, the first two deal with the semi-inclusive reactions uh, and the third with exclusive reactions. Uh, in order to access uh, observables that are sensitive to elusive quantity inside the confined states of the nucleon. Uh, these uh, were um, rated uh, with a maximum uh, grade, A, and granted with uh, 110 uh, uh, running days. Uh, under the technical condition to um, 
show that the target that uh, the experiments uh, propose is able to sustain the polarization um, under the uh, charge beam uh, interaction. Uh, <clears throat> all the experiments were selected among the high impact JLab measurements 2014. And uh, um, as a, let's say, important news, uh, since then, uh, the physics program of RGH <clears throat> became uh, one of the pillars of the approved science case for EIC. So it is pretty interesting and a live subject. So let me start with unpolarized case. That is uh, uh, the topic of the previous talks, so RGA and RGB, just to say that it is the base of the measurements we want to do, as was already discussed um, this morning. Um, <clears throat> this, um, with a semi-inclusive reaction, we are able to study the uh, distribution in the momentum space, um, uh, the 3D. And that these have implication not only for our studies, because it um, uh, should be the fundamental for any uh, polarization dependent measurements, but also has a broad interest and impact, as an example, the uh, W mass precise measurements at LHC uh, with an uncertainty that is comparable with other sources. Um, in uh, <clears throat> uh, CDs, uh, we have uh, a rich phenomenology because we have the intrinsic transfer momentum of the parton distribution, but also the one that is produced during fragmentation. And so we have a correlation that are difficult to disentangle, as you can see here on the uh, bottom left. But um, the good point is that uh, there is a, a variety of data that are coming from uh, uh, the E plus E minus colliders that can be used in order to uh, disentangle the information. Um, just a side remark, uh, I'm going to show several phenomenologic uh, studies that uh, came from a group in Italy that is among the proponents, and this just to show that we will have a theoretical support in order to uh, guide us in defining the best uh, way to extract the observables. So let's move to the focus of this run group, that is transverse polarization. In this case, you see that the quark distribution is not any more um, isotropic or symmetric uh, because there is a correlation with the uh, orbital motion of the quarks and the final state interaction. These are uh, the kind of uh, uh, dynamics effects that we want to study of the strong force that can be seen as a spin orbit effects within the nucleon. Um, you know that uh, um, um, evidences of this effect were found uh, um, on CDS experiments uh, of the order of 10 years ago at Hermes and Compass. Since then, uh, the measurements uh, improved to a level that uh, demonstrate the um, existence of such an effect, but the uh, statistical precision was, uh, was never improved to a level to allow serious multidimensional analysis, despite they were attempted and even published by Hermes recently. <clears throat> uh, lately, the interest uh, moved to other reactions like uh, Drellian and um, vector mesos production in um, hadronic colliders uh, in order to prove the anticipated uh, sign change of this effect uh, moving from Cities to Drellian. <clears throat> So I'll show here uh, one of the latest extraction. Uh, on the right, you see the comparison with other that are available on the market. You see that there is quite a broad range of uh, possibilities for this, for this function. And I like to point a few uh, remarks that were, uh, were um, highlighted in this extraction. The first is that it is important to have a consistent uh, uh, study of the unpolarized and polarized uh, uh, observable together, and this is one of the goals of the experiment, as was explained uh, so far, that uh, uh, there is a region that is not covered by the data right now where the extrapolation is quest questionable, and in particular in the valence region where class 12 uh, wants to work. And uh, that one of the largest chi square came from the chaos sector that class 12 want to measure. 
So this just to point out that experiments um, um, plan to address um, questions that are still on the table. And uh, um, interesting is to notice that uh, uh, in the last years there was a strong effort in Lattice in order to provide uh, quantities that are related to these new uh, Parton distribution functions. Here you see an example uh, that is the silver shift, so this imbalance that you have in the targets um, that is now started to be calculated in Lattice. <clears throat> so if you have a such kind of dynamics and uh, spin orbit correlation in the target, you, uh, you can have also in the fragmentation process. This is the Collins effect uh, that was shown to be uh, real, uh, both in series uh, reactions on the left and uh, in the plus and minus annihilation that the B factor is on the right. Uh, <clears throat> you see also in this case uh, we have a, a, a clear signal, but the statistic is limited and do not really allow a multidimensional analysis, also does not cover uh, the valence region uh, very well, uh, so there is a uh, space for improvement. In the last years, the um, interest uh, uh, moved to, uh, to the fragmentation functions that are uh, quite important in order to access information on the target uh, and the study was extended to the transverse moment of dependence that was missing at, at the beginning and to the unpolarized uh, uh, fragmentation functions. Uh, together with that, uh, the study of the dihedron channel that provide a new way to uh, access the transversity, that is uh, the uh, fundamental part of distribution function, in a way that is complementary to the TMD's formalism that is applied when you are dealing with the Collins function. So the Collins function uh, is for CDs when you look only to a single hadron in the final state, that if you have two hadrons, you can claim that you have correlation between the relative momentum of the two of the pair, and you integrate the transverse momentum, uh, the average transverse momentum of the pair. In this way, you move back to a collinear framework that uh, is complementary and uh, <clears throat> uh, it is quite important to validate the extraction using TMD's formalism. Uh, you see here in the bottom the study, uh, an important feature is that uh, uh, this does not have the limitation or uh, the issues in factorization, so it can be extended to the hadronic reactions, so uh, can deal with a, a larger set of data. And here you see an example of what you will gain on the right for the decays when you will um, add the compass data that will be available uh, in uh, over the road of three years from now after the COVID uh, delay. Uh, you still see, however, that there is a, a large uncertainty. And also in this case, there is an effort in Lattice to provide valuable information. In case, even the X dependent goes beyond the simple moments. Uh, the moment of this function, however, is pretty important, is the uh, tensor charge, is fundamental, and uh, enters uh, uh, searches for beyond standard model, uh, you, <clears throat> the, where, um, let's say, low energy experiments with high precision can uh, compete with um, the research made at uh, the energy frontier, and even probe scales that cannot be reached at LHC. Uh, you see on the left an example where uh, you take a uh, nuclear decays or uh, semi-leptonic decays and, uh, uh, the, um, and uh, having under control the tensor charge, you can put the constraints on the tensor, tensor coupling that are competitive with LHC. On the right, another way to show uh, these things is the fact that uh, um, <clears throat> with respect to the uh, intrinsic uh, error of the measurement that is provided by the grade band, when you uh, use the tensor charge from the lattice, you add in quadrature a uh, negligible error, and so your uh, data points and error bars uh, have the same uh, error. While when, when you're trying to use the experimental extractions, uh, uh, you have a much wider error, and that uh, shows basically that there is still a lot of improvement to be done in the experiment. Another example is the electric, electric dipole moments where the tensor charge connects the ones of the uh, nucleon to the one of the uh, quarks. 
um, the exclusive case is quite rich. I'm uh, here uh, showing the golden channel that is the UCS. Here in literature now we started to have a variety of different measurements, but the one with the transverse pro uh, proton target is still uh, unique, was done at Hermes um, several years ago. And so this will be an important uh, piece in the uh, in the study. Uh, let me uh, stress that um, uh, lately um, uh, the experiment proven to be able to extract directly the cross sections, and this is a quite important step forward for such kind of measurement. The uh, experiment class 12 uh, have a program that is comprehensive and plan to study um, asymmetry that are sensitive to the various GPDs, in particular to the one, to the E1 that enters the JSON rule connected with orbital angular momenta. Of the quarks and uh, <clears throat> wants to uh, measure it uh, on proton with a transverse target and a neutron with a beam uh, uh, polarization, as was explained uh, uh, in the previous talk. And so we provide um, a, a complementary approaches and uh, uh, flavor separation. So this is a slide that I presented in 2012 to the PAC at the time of approval, just to show the status at that time. So uh, class 12 was under construction. HTI's target, that is the one we propose, uh, was designed and used for uh, photon beams, and the bridge was in prototyping stage only. Now class 12 is uh, running experiments since a couple of years. Um, it's proven to be able to uh, work inside the DIS regime uh, with an uh, extended Q square range and uh, an extended reach in uh, Z and PT that are the hadronic variables. Uh, this is quite important in order to study the uh, expected dependencies, as an example, the Q square uh, running, uh, isolate peculiar regimes from the target. Uh, um, fragmentation up to the exclusive region in Z, and study the transition regions, as an example in PT, moving from uh, the um, perturbative uh, to the, uh, sorry, to the, from the non-perturbative to the perturbative tail at high PT. Uh, <clears throat> this uh, feature is quite important and is um, um, granted because class 12 is a wide open acceptance detector. This is just a flash to show you that the experiment is working. On the left, uh, the identification of pi zeros in different calorimeters. On the right, the identification of the charged particles. Top is time of flight that works at low momenta. And the uh, bottom is reach that works at high momenta. <clears throat> uh, the experiment uh, uh, works uh, properly. Uh, the reconstruction programs were um, realized in the last couple of years, and a uh, sizable fraction of the data was produced in order uh, to allow analysis. And now we are in the final review stage of uh, uh, two uh, semi-inclusive analyses, uh, one on the single hadron, one on the dihedron, so proving the capability of the experiments to study what is proposed by this run group. And in the bottom, you see an example that uh, uh, highlight how the class 12 data are superior with respect to the uh, one of class at 6 GV and enter uh, and extend inside the DIS regime in Q square. You have five minutes left, Marco. Yes, for the exclusive channel, um, we have a central detector and we are able to connect the information between the two, the forward and the central. And in the bottom row, you see um, uh, particle identification, the central detector, and at the top uh, right um, plot uh, an example in one bin of our kinematical space of uh, clear DVCS asymmetry. <clears throat> so uh, now I'm flashing about the hardware that we are developing for this run group. The first is the reach I already mentioned that is working properly, at least the first module that was installed before the starting the data taking is able to identify the particles in the wanted momentum range. And the second reach module that is under construction uh, in an advanced stage and is uh, planned to uh, be installed uh, next year, at the end of next year, to create a sim symmetric setup that would be pretty suitable 
for experimenting with a transverse target. So we'll provide a left-right symmetric um, setup. <clears throat> Finally, let me uh, present a target that uh, is proposed, that is an innovative uh, target, uh, that is a frozen spin and using HD molecular. Uh, the idea is to minimize the dilution that the standard targets ha have, um, like the ammonia, where there is uh, the um, nitrogen atom. And also, being frozen spin do not require, does not require strong magnetic fields and simplify the um, setup and also increase the acceptance. That is quite important as an example for exclusive channels. <clears throat> uh, the disadvantages of such kind of targets that they require long polarization times and being frozen spin um, should, should, be de um, should be demonstrated that it can sustain the um, charge beam uh, interaction. In 2012, uh, opportunistic uh, uh, test beam was done while the target was uh, being used with uh, photon beams. However, that target was not designed for charge beams and the test basically allowed to identify and, uh, uh, possible issues. And since then, we uh, worked on the mitigation measures. So you can have uh, chemical change, changes in the target that can produce again ortho hydrogen that will depolarize the target. These were excluded at that time looking to the gas after the radiation. Uh, you may have hyperfine mixings with the electrons in the target, but these can be suppressed to a large extent by using an RF uh, transition to align the electron and nucleon uh, spins. And then you're left with uh, umpire electrons that can be created by the beam ionization. Uh, those, if are unpolarized, will uh, act as uh, depolarization centers. So you want to keep them polarized, and that means to keep the local temperature uh, low in order the spin is frozen. And there is where many uh, improvements were made on the target geometry, cooling system, and also the beam rastering system in order to distribute the load um, uh, over the target and reduce the increase of temperature uh, locally. All these improvements will be tested and in the new um, uh, update injector test beam facility that is now under commissioning. And uh, the uh, target system is there, ready to take data and awaiting the commissioning to be uh, to be completed. And we expect uh, uh, within this year, uh, within this sorry month, the beam uh, inside our uh, target cryostat. <coughs> uh, the last uh, item uh, is the. A magnetic system that is quite not trivial for such a kind of target because it works within the class 12 central solenoid. Uh, uh, during, uh, at the time of the proposal, we uh, developed a traditional superconducting uh, solution. Uh, but now, uh, since then, we have a novel system that uh, is superior uh, and is using a bulk superconducting uh, um, magnet, basically a cylinder, that uh, <clears throat> can be um, prepared in an external magnetic field and uh, bring it to the working temperature, so uh, below the critical uh, point. At that point, it frozen the uh, magnetic field. And uh, if the external one is uh, modified, uh, it uh, reacts producing currents in order to uh, preserve the uh, field inside. Uh, oh, without time, any... please, can you speed up a little? Yeah, yeah, this is the last slide before the conclusion, so I'm basically done. Uh, it will create the currents, but do not spend to, to compensate, but do not spend energy. In this way, uh, it becomes like a permanent magnet that will be able even to screen exter the external solenoid magnet when it is power on. Uh, of course, does not require uh, current leads. Uh, is solid with respect quenches because simply redistribute uh, the current in in inside the bulk and uh, uh, um, reduce the material budget and increase the acceptance because does not require um, to be um, surrounded by copper. 
just because it is solid with respect to edges. Uh, on the left, you see uh, the working principles. When you go down in temperature, you are able to trap the, magnet the magnetic field, in this case, up to one Tesla with a few millimeters material, and keep for long times. In this case, it's 10 days on the bottom, but we keep also for one month, provided that you keep it cool. So this is a, a let's say, brilliant solution that will simplify uh, the setup uh, in favor of the physics. So altogether, we are working hard to make RGH experiments a reality. Uh, since the proposal, important progresses were made. The science case has been inflated towards EAC. Class 12 is up and running and is ideal for studying in a large kinematical uh, phase space such reactions. The first module of the REACH is working, the second is coming soon. And for the HDIs, we are ready to go with the tests after the improvements, and we have a new magnet configuration that uh, magnifies the sensitivity for the physics. So what we request is to confirm the conditionally approved beam time and let us to complete the job. Thank you very much. This uh, experiment is again uh, read by Feng Yuan. Please, Feng, uh, go ahead with your questions. Oh, Mark, uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for the nice presentation. Uh, so, if I understand correctly, so everything is ready. Is that right? Uh, well, almost ready. I mean, this, the, the, the experiment is ready. The second reach is under construction, but we don't expect uh, surprises because the first uh, will be, uh, let's say, a copy of the first that is already working. Uh, the target is ready, but uh, we have to accomplish the tests, demonstrate uh, that we can sustain a suitable polarization. That is the condition that uh, PAC uh, put with the approval. So in this sense, we are ready to make the tests for the target. So what, 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 what would be the timeline? Timeline is likely before the, the, the year, before the end of the year, sorry. Uh, we were ready to start uh, just before the COVID crisis spread out. And so we had uh, importantly, uh, important delay, but the laboratory support was so good that we restarted the, um, uh, the operation during the summer. And now we are close to be able to start really the test with the in-beam cryostat there because the beam is running. Okay. Of Thank course, you. we will start. We will start with an empty target at the beginning, so the test will stay for uh, a while. Of course, we will go step by step, but we hope to have um, the results before the end of the year. Uh, I, I just have one <laughs> minor comment. Uh, in your in your beginning of your uh, presentation, you mentioned about uh, your running group uh, program becomes a pillar for ESC science case. I would say that even before that, uh, uh, transfer the polarized target uh, already is was a pillar for the ESA science. Has been extensively discussed uh, during whatever uh, white paper and also uh, INT program. That's where minor comment. Uh, no, no, Marcos and Sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, what I was saying I, I completely agree with you. Uh, I mean. Science case is there. Probably I, I didn't make clear enough that uh, the, the, the difference is that now there is an official approval by the National Science Academy and also the city zero. So it's not anymore, let's say, it, it is a recognized science case even uh, outside our uh, field. This sense was inflated. Yeah, agree. Uh, Marcus, uh, I'm done with my question. Thank you very much, uh, thing. Is there any question from anyone else on the committee? That does not seem to be the case. You see, I think I... Uh, then uh, let's thank Marco again, and uh, we switch to the next presentation. This will be given by Sebastian Kuhn, and he will update us on run group C. Please, Sebastian. Okay. Can you hear me? We hear you. 
And I am trying to share the screen. Can you see my screen? Yet? Great. Uh, now we can see it. You're set to go. Great. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm sorry you will have to listen to one more run group presentation. But that's the last one for today. Um, so I'm here to represent run group C, which uh, combines all experiments with a longitudinally polarized uh, proton and neutron target or deuteron target in class 12. So I will give you a brief update on the science goals, or an overview of the science goals, uh, the status of our uh, preparations for the run, and the actual run plan. Um, so uh, the the main goal of uh, several of these experiments, of course, is to study the three-dimensional one and three-dimensional platonic structure of the nucleon in the valence region. Uh, and uh, in particular, of course, uh, run group C uh, wants to study the spin structure of the nucleon, both in one dimension by looking at spin structure functions A1 and G1 of the proton and neutron at large x, uh, and also combining this with uh, flavor tagging to, um, uh, to, to tag the quark uh, uh, that was struck. Um, and finally, uh, providing an anchor for PDF fits, uh, which will allow us to further constrain even the gluon distribution at large x. Uh, at the same time, we want to extend this to three dimensions, both in the momentum space by, look, by measuring spin and transverse momentum dependent uh, PDFs, EMDs. Uh, and uh, last but not least, uh, uh, DVCS, the, the polarized target, and also uh, beam target double spin asymmetries for both the proton and the neutron. So uh, there's a total of uh, seven experiments in run group C. Five have been actually approved separately by the PAC, uh, and two are run group additions that came on later. The latest one, actually, you you uh, approved or you, you were presented uh, a month ago and uh, endorsed. Um, so uh, each one of these experiments has a slightly different number of approved days. But if you make the uh, union of all these sets of approved days, you find that uh, it can be uh, summarized as 120 days on the proton. 60 days on the deuteron and five days for auxiliary measurement. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit. Oh, this is bad. Uh, it's uh, unfortunately um, something has happened. So I'm going to um, close this and try a different version. Sorry, understand why it did that. So, let me see. Yeah, that works. Okay. So, um, so this is the situation of as of today. Um, spin structure functions for the proton and the deuteron at large x, and as you can tell. There are many, many data, but they all peter around, uh, out around x of 0.6. Beyond that, there are only a few measurements with extremely large error bars. And so we still cannot completely even rule out the naive SU6 uh, approach to x goes to 1. So this is uh, what um, we hope to change. So here are the expected new data overlaid and uh, not only do they have much smaller error bars and they go up to x of 0.8 but also each data point uh, in x uh, covers a wide range in q squared which uh, allows for these um, GIGLAB analyses um, and therefore even the gluon ex uh, extraction. Um, these inclusive data will be uh, all by themselves will allow us to um, make a statement about 
the behavior of the D quark polarization as X goes to one, which is one of the outstanding puzzles. Uh, um, and by uh, adding uh, tagged structure functions, uh, tagged by uh, pion or k on production, uh, we get a similar uh, data set. And so these two together both uh, serve to minimize uh, systematic uncertainties or model dependence, but also to uh, even reduce this error bars even more. Um, so this is still a very active uh, field of uh, interest. Um, it's of course uh, prominently featured in the uh, long and the most recent 2015 uh, long range plan. Um, and there are constantly new papers coming out, uh, conferences, uh, and, and new approaches, including uh, lattice QCD calculations. Um, here is just a, a selection of a few papers. As you can tell, two of them are from this year. So this is still uh, 10 years after these experiments were approved. This is still um, a very great interest. Uh, in addition, uh, as I said, we are also going to look at the three-dimensional structure of the nucleon, both in momentum and uh, position. And uh, we will measure both uh, leading twist and higher twist uh, TMDs. Uh, here is the cotinian molder asymmetry, which requires a longitudinally polarized target. And there, are, of course, there are some data from Hermes and even from class. 6 GeV, but again, our uh, error bars will be significantly smaller and extend to higher X and also, very importantly, uh, cover a larger PT range. And, um, and, and uh, we also can look at some of these uh, structure functions that you can measure in an inclusive scattering, but uh, break them down uh, by the transverse momentum PT. Uh, which is both interesting in itself. So you can answer the question, are quarks that spin in the same direction as the nucleon, um, do they have the same transverse momentum distribution uh, as those that spin in the opposite direction? But this is also very important to properly interpret um, these uh, fragmentation functions that are required to, to measure uh, uh, flavor tagged quark distributions. Um, and again, uh, we also will measure uh, the um, DBCS uh, to access the spatial distribution of quarks correlated with their um, longitudinal momentum. And uh, this is just uh, a part of the overall GPD program, um, so that uh, the quantities that are most closely related to what we can measure are these Compton form factors. And uh, to extract all four of these uh, Compton form factors for both the proton and the neutron uh, requires measurements on both uh, proton targets and neutron targets, obviously, or deuterium in this case, but it also on longitudinal transverse polarized target uh, as well as with polarized uh, beam. So um, all of this is really required to get as complete and uh, as little mo mo uh, model dependent uh, information. Uh, here is one example for the for neutron DVCS. This is uh, very similar to uh, what Sylvia showed for run group B, and we can do the same thing uh, for um, uh, polarized target. So. Um, this, uh, these are all separate bins uh, in X and T and uh, Q squared, and for each bin you get a phi distribution. So um, by combining uh, all of this information, we can then extract the nucleon Compton form factors. Uh, the dots here are for the proton and the red uh, data points are for the neutron. And of course, the neutron has a significant, significantly larger uncertainty. But as you can tell, you, you have to use both to combine, uh, combine them to extract uh, 
information on the up and down quarks separately. And so the error bars, even for the up quarks, are somewhat uh, determined by how well you measure the, uh, the neutron. Okay, so um, going from the physics to the preparations, this experiment, of course, has been uh, in the making for a while, and uh, a very uh, significant effort was uh, started to provide the polarized target for this experiment. Uh, it's uh, been a collaboration of several institutions. Um, and at this point, um, the uh, target is 90% uh, complete, and you can actually see it here. This is the target it's, uh, vessel itself, uh, the pumps, uh, microwaves, uh, NMR system, uh, and uh, flow controls. And uh, this has been uh, tested using the five Tesla thrust solenoid in the eel building. Uh, so we've had uh, already three um, cool down tests, and we have planned three more for the immediate future. Uh, and then the whole thing in its final configuration will be tested at the, in September 2021. After that, we should be ready to install immediately uh, as soon as, as we get the green light. Um, here are some details. So the refrigerator has been uh, built and it's uh, been tested. It uh, can reach indeed the one Kelvin temperature that we would like uh, and um, at, at reasonable levels of power uh, uh, dissipation and, and coolant consumption. Um, one of the unique features of this refrigerator is that um, the entire uh, helium bath uh, can be retracted uh, along this direction such that the target, which normally for the actual uh, polarized ammonia sits here, but that can be retracted, so it can be accessed uh, through this port without having to disassemble anything. And that will allow us to switch uh, between different target configurations, target materials, and as I said earlier, also between uh, orientation of uh, the double celled target. All that will be possible. Then, um, yeah, some of the other important ingredients. Uh, these are first tests for the uh, NMR coils. Um, this is a mock up of the um, uh, microwave uh, radiator. Um, we built our own uh, replacement for, sorry, for the so called Liverpool Q meters, which are getting very old and for which there are no spares. So um, we already have electronic in hand that is uh, at least as good as the Liverpool Q meters, but more modular, more modern, easily to fix if ne necessary. And we are still uh, doing some R&D and see whether we can improve further on that. But as you can see at the bottom right, we can certainly measure uh, the typical NMR curves and uh, polarization in this target. Um, Finally, uh, the target magnet is just a standard class 12 solenoid for the central detector. Um, this has, has been uh, mapped uh, in great detail, but, uh, and it's, it's nearly good enough just as is, but to improve the, uh, the homogeneity in this uh, critical central region to get even higher polarization, uh, we've developed a set of uh, correction coils that uh, here, this is a mock-up with uh, normal copper wire, but ultimately we will use uh, superconducting wire and we've tested all the parts of that um, already. And uh, we could actually show that uh, these uh, indeed uh, allow us to compensate for uh, in homogeneities. And as I said earlier, we can also produce a slightly different field in this region versus this region uh, in case we want to run with a double cell target. On the right hand side you see the design of the carrier for the target as it will be in the hall. Uh, this is the top part which contains all of the electronics and then the bottom part will contain the pumps. That part is uh, presently being 
put together in the EEL building and will be ready shortly. So here is a somewhat yeah, five minutes left. Yeah, no problem. Here's a somewhat busy slide showing uh, how uh, this whole thing uh, planned to be put together. Um, uh, the, the bottom line is that uh, in September next year, we will do a dress rehearsal with every component in its final uh, state and uh, operation. Uh, and that sort of jibes with the present official uh, accelerator schedule, published schedule, which uh, goes uh, end of the 2021 running around October 21st. So after that, we can immediately begin installation of this target, which, by the way, is not going to take all that long, uh, maybe a month. So here's the proposed run plan. Um, as I said earlier, the total number of approved uh, pack days is uh, 185. So we will, like all class, long class run periods, will be split in, into two. The first half should run then uh, in uh, 2022 at the latest. Um, and during that run, we can uh, complete those experiments that didn't request uh, a small angle photon detection, uh, in other words, the forward tagger, um, which makes it a little easier to run at high luminosity. Um, and then we come back with, uh, to run the additional pack days, uh, including the forward tagger, which is particularly important for the DBCS program. Uh, so, um, I, I don't want to bore you with all the details about the run conditions, but uh, keep in mind, we, we want to use all parts of uh, class 12, um, except for the forward tagger for the first part, and uh, we can't afford to put in the band detector. But other than that, uh, we even have a new uh, forward micromega tracker, which uh, we already tested during the bonus experiment, which just completed. Um, so, and, and of course, we are hoping for that second sector of the rich, which um, we just heard is uh, planned to be ready in fall next year. So here's my summary. Um, we have uh, several highly rated experiment in this run group. Uh, two are A rated, uh, which are directly addressing the core program of uh, Jefferson Lab, um, and they are mentioned in the NSAC long range plan. Uh, there's a continuous interest in the commu community. So um, have, we are getting very close to being ready to run this experiment. And that was a significant investment by both the lab and uh, others. Uh, we did pass an experimental readiness review last year and also submitted our. Um, beam time request at that time. Uh, so we should be ready to begin running by the end of the year to 2021. And um, we ask from you a reapproval of the entire run group as, as originally approved. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sebastian. So we now have time for questions. Elke uh, Aschnauer is the reader of this experiment, so uh, Elke, please go ahead. Hello. Um, Hello. So, uh, first of all, thank you for your answers to my emails also, and I would like to come back to one, um, mm -hmm. and that has to do with the uh, synchrotron radiation. So, uh -huh. indeed, it is a longitudinal uh, solenoid, but uh, if you move the beam of axis in a solenoid, you get, of course, uh, also kind of uh, transverse components, and you will generate uh, a synchrotron radiation from an electron beam. So I and you raster by as we exchange by plus minus one centimeter or something like this. So uh, I was just wondering, have you really looked into? You really don't get significant synchrotron radiation because it's an intense beam. And it's a five Tesla magnet, as far as I remember. Yeah, it's a five Tesla magnet. And um, so the beam will be 
mostly uh, or exactly parallel to the center, uh, to the magnetic field in the center of that uh, magnet. Uh, it will, of course, encounter um, fringe fields, which are a little bit, but they are significant lower uh, by the time you get far enough out. It's only one centimeter. Um, the beam is not that intense, actually. Uh, the target okay. The target is very uh, thick, so we can run with uh, something like 5 to 10 nanoamps. So that's a really low beam. And okay, so so you studied carefully that there is no effect of this. Okay, good. Um, I would like to go back a little bit on uh, the studies for um, PDFs, and particularly helicity and, to some extent, um, the uh, TMDs as well. DVCS is very special because uh, you can study that only in EP. Um, yeah. As we exchanged, there have been a lot of measurements. There have been measurements uh, by Compass. There has been measurements by RIC, uh, mm -hmm. both on the Delta G, but also uh, more importantly on the quarks. And they are also at a high X region, the W reach axis of uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.6 with very high. And uh, the plots you show, uh, yes, there is a lot of uh, work done in lattice and so on, but the PDF fits you showed, a lot of them don't take the new data into account. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, uh, you have done actually a recent study on the impact of your data on really constraining UND and also have taken into account things which we have been discussing also in the last pack on how well actually really Kon production uh, and so on is understood, uh, for example, at JLabs that you can really constrain strangeness. Yeah, so I mean, I should first say that um, as far as uh, understanding the impact of these data, uh, we do, of course, collaborate mostly with the JAM collaboration um, at, at Jefferson Lab. Uh, and so here is, uh, for instance, an exercise they did a, a, a couple of years ago on the impact of uh, specifically these uh, proposed data on on these um, various uh, polarized quark distribution functions. And um, I am not obviously qualified to defend exactly uh, the details of of this this uh, study, but in any case, it shows that uncertainties for all types of uh, are at least reduced by a factor of two or more. Uh, particularly, uh, U, delta U and delta D uh, is uh, going to be significantly reduced. And so that's. Can I make a comment on this? Yeah. Uh, this study didn't include the RIC data at all and uh, is very often a very limited part of the world data. Yeah. So um, this study um, actually is, um, uh, as I said, a little bit older. Uh, in the meantime, um, uh, there have been uh, more comprehensive analyses, both unpolarized and polarized structure functions. Um, in, and that did include, at least for the unpolarized case, uh, W um, uh, uh, production. Uh, I've looked, this is the most recent result I'm, I'm finding from Rick, but you probably have better ones. Uh, the point is that what we really, if, if we wanted to uh, point to the, the most important region, it is really between 0.6 and 0.8 in X, and that's just not accessible with that kind of both resolution and also um, statistical power um, with, uh, outside of, of Jefferson Lab, I think. Okay. Um, and, and they did actually do a very interesting study uh, about the strange quark. So yes, you can see that here, uh, the, this one here, is with an earlier version of, of their own uh, um, their own approach, and then uh, by doing a simultaneous fit of all the uh, the fragmentation functions as well as the um, PDFs, they find that there's actually a much larger uncertainty. So this is definitely um, 
an interesting question. Uh, I only have, I don't know whether this will answer your question, but one of the things that seem to be more sensitive to strange quarks uh, is K minus production of the deuteron. So that's that's just a pitch why we want to actually uh, also keep um, the statistics on the deuteron as high as possible. Yeah, that is the same idea Hermes followed. And then you realize that you have, of course, uh, problems with the target uh, mass and so on because your W is so low. But yes, OK, good. I, it to some extent answers my question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't think I have many more, Markus. Thank you, Elke. Um, Volker Bogart has typed uh, a comment to you into the chat if you'd like to take a quick look and see if you're happy with that. I Again, don't about see. The synchrotron radiation. Okay. Okay, then let's thank uh, Sebastian for his presentation and we move on to the last presentation uh, of today. That is an update on run group I and it's given by Timothy Nelson. Please, Timothy. Uh, Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you, yes. And let's try if you can see your slides. Do you see my slides? Not yet, but it normally takes a while. Now we see them, you're all set to go. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon and good evening. Thanks for uh, sticking it out through the long day. I know these, uh, these uh, long days can be quite difficult. Um, I'm going to be giving you an update on the heavy photon search or HPS experiment on behalf of the collaboration. So something a little bit different from most of what you've been hearing. Um, so heavy photons, uh, also known as hidden photons or dark photons, uh, are uh, new vector bosons, uh, sometimes called A prime, that can in principle mix with the standard model photon uh, through loops of heavy particles that couple to both. Um, this kinetic, so-called kinetic mixing, uh, introduces a small coupling between this dark photon and standard model fermions that we parameterize by uh, epsilon, which is naturally in the range of 10 to the minus few, potentially as small as 10 to the minus seven or so. And this coupling between the dark photon and the standard model fermions gives rise to a number of new processes, and in particular gives rise to dark Bremsstrahlung production in electron fixed target experiments where an electron can instead of bremming off a photon can brem off a dark photon at a rate proportional to epsilon squared. Uh, the dark photon then decays into perhaps a plus e minus pair. Um, the dark photon uh, being more massive than the electron carries away most of the beam uh, energy and so its decay products are energetic, uh, forward and very collimated. So why are these things interesting and the key motivation that has really um, developed uh, for this physics is the potential of low mass freeze out thermal relics. So this is dark matter that's generated in the early universe, just like WIMPs uh, through thermal freeze out, but instead is in the MeV to GeV range. Now in this lower mass range, MeV to GeV, um, thermal relic dark matter produced through freeze out requires new comparably light mediators to get the right annihilation cross section uh, to produ produce the observed relic abundance. If you make the WIMP too light, uh, the cross-section uh, gets too small and you end up freezing out early and you have more dark matter than we observe today. So dark photons are actually the favored scenario for this coupling between uh, the dark sector and the standard model sector, where um, in this direct annihilation diagram, one has dark matter on the left side coupling to the dark photon through alpha dark, the standard model uh, on the right side coupling to the photon uh, through, through uh, alpha, and in the middle, this kinetic mixing epsilon. So in our experiments, when we produce dark photons, uh, what happens to them depends on the relationship between the dark photon mass and uh, the dark matter mass. And in particular, what we're interested in here is the case where the dark photon is lighter than twice the dark matter mass. And if I produce an on-shell dark photon in my experiment, it has no choice but to decay back through kinetic mixing to, um, to standard model particles, either, uh, for example, E plus E minus or mu plus mu minus. And so in those experiments, we say we're looking for dark photons that are decaying to the standard model. Um, and HPS is one of the experiments in this space. There are a number of others, uh, experiments uh, already uh, running uh, and uh, proposed uh, and potential future experiments. Um, now, uh, 
So these experiments uh, typically measure or constrain epsilon squared through the rate as a function of the mass of this, this dark photon. Now, how we interpret uh, this result also depends on the relationship between the dark photon mass and the dark matter mass, and there are really two cases of interest here. One, if the dark photon is heavier than the dark matter, then uh, in the early universe, at the time of dark matter production, um, uh, uh, the only process available is this direct annihilation diagram, um, which, is, uh, which uh, produces the thermal relic abundance, and uh, that's proportional to epsilon squared alpha dark. And because we know something about what this cross-section has to be, because we know the relic abundance, that we actually know something about what epsilon has to be. And in particular, there's a lower limit on epsilon for thermal relics. If it's below that, again, we would overproduce dark matter in the early. Um, meanwhile, if the dark photon is lighter than the dark matter mass, um, you can have so-called secluded annihilation that doesn't depend on epsilon. And in that case, there's no clear target for what epsilon could be. One has only these top-down theoretical motivations for what's a natural value of epsilon as a function of mass in this MeV to G. So let's take a look at the parameter space uh, that we're interested in in searching for visible decays of dark photons. And that parameter space is shown here. Um, so epsilon squared versus uh, dark photon mass. So this is uh, the rough region that corresponds to what I refer to as the thermal targets. Um, so for a particular uh, choice of alpha dark and the mass ratio between the dark photon and the dark matter, uh, these are the values of uh, epsilon and mass that would, uh, that, would, uh, that would produce the correct uh, relic abundance. Uh, everything above these lines is, of course, uh, also possible if, if the dark matter is just a subcomponent of the dark matter halo that we observe. Um, so there are a number of constraints from previous experiments. Um, most of the constraints at, at larger coupling are from uh, simple bump hunts or resonance searches for uh, E plus E minus or mu plus mu minus resonances. Um, and then uh, down here, there are a number of other constraints that come from the fact that as I make the coupling small and at low mass, uh, the A prime decay is suppressed and it becomes long lived. This leads to constraints from beam dump experiments where if I bring a very intense beam into a target, I have a shield downstream with a decay region and a detector. If I suppress the, if, if the A prime becomes long lived enough and I give it enough boost, then it can travel through this shield that screens out all the standard model backgrounds and I can look for a signal in the detector downstream in time with my incoming beam. So that's what these constraints are down here. Now there's this big juicy territory that we'd like to get into in the middle here. And it's in fact very difficult to get into here, um, both from above, where you need orders of magnitude more beam intensity and a way to instrument it, and from below, where you need a thinner and thinner shield and higher and higher boost, and at some point, your shield gets so thin you're not screening out your standard model backgrounds anymore. So um, in this intermediate region, you need something else. What you need is an actual decay length measurement, a measurement of where uh, the, the A prime decay downstream of where it was produced in the target uh, that, that produces your final state. So that is exactly um, what the HPS experiment is. So it's a compact electron-positron spectrometer. Um, so this is a, a, a tracker built inside of a dipole magnet. It's immediately downstream of a thin target in Hall B. So the heart of the experiment is a low-mass, high-rate silicon tracker, the so-called SVT, um, which lives inside a vacuum chamber in the dipole. This allows vertexing of long-lived A primes. Uh, where the, the, the task is to suppress standard model tridents that come from the target by a very large factor. Now, most of the hits in this SVT are from single scattered electrons. Um, so to screen out those hits, uh, the time structure, the continuous wave time structure of the CBAP beam is very important. So that, that CW time structure together with a very fast trigger on E plus E minus pairs that comes from this lead, lead tung state ECAL downstream, uh, allows you to select just the, the hits of interest from the SVT to reconstruct the in-time hits with the E plus E minus pair. Um, and then another attribute of CBAF that's really critical for this experiment is that excellent beam quality allows the silicon to get um, within half a millimeter of the beam line, which is what we need for the forward acceptance for the physics. So the silicon tracker is split above and below the beam line in the ECAL as well, where here you can see what the silicon tracker looks like on a table in the clean room split above and below. Now this instrument was built uh, in 2014 and installed in early 2015, and there were a pair of opportunistic engineering runs, uh, both in 2015 and again in 2016, that collected some small physics data sets with what I would call pre-CBAF-12 beam, so before CBAF-12 was really fully commissioned. 
So the 2015 data set uh, allowed development of the complete analysis chain and proved the concept of the experiment with first results. First, a resonant search with this small data sample here, published in PRD as a rapid communication, and the displaced vertex search, where you're also asking not just the mass, but what the Z vertex position was, and this is after a large number of cuts to clean up the long-lived backgrounds. And so the red line is the line above which you expect to have very low background. And if you take a slice of this and look at uh, what, what the cut flow looks like, you can see how the, the selections uh, are responsible for eliminating all these long-lived backgrounds where you can be sensitive for a prime decays out here on the positive Z tail. So since that run in late 2019, uh, sorry, since, pardon me. So um, another thing that we learned from these engineering run data sets were some important lessons about actual backgrounds and acceptances uh, that motivated improvements to the experiment. So, um, so this was in, in particular the addition of a silicon layer closer to the target, which in principle can um, improve the vertex resolution by about a factor of two. Uh, the second thing was to move some of the silicon layers closer to the beam line it improves acceptance for long-lived decays, decays where the A prime travels some distance into the detector before decay. This helps us get more forward acceptance for these long-lived decays. And finally, the addition of a positron hodoscope in front of the ECAL that recovers some trigger acceptance loss due to high frequency crystals around the electron hole in the ECAL. Again, the, the degraded beam has to go through the middle of the detector. There's a hole in the ECAL for that. And some number of electrons from signal A prime are lost to crystals that are removed uh, from that hole. And uh, so by having a, a hodoscope on the positron side that can distinguish uh, positrons from photons that are on the positron side, we can have a single leg trigger, a positron only trigger. So these upgrades were completed in advance of operations in late summer 2019, where we took two weeks of live physics data at four and a half GeV. So recent progress, now I'm in the right place. So since the 2019 run, a uh, couple of, uh, Notable areas of progress. First, the completion of the analysis of the 2016 data set. So each generation of these analyses, again, has taught us some important lessons and helped us improve our techniques. Uh, and the 2016 data set's been no different. Uh, careful analysis of the 2016 data set has been completed. No signal's been observed. First, in the resonance search here, you see the epsilon squared up, upper limit as a function of mass. And then in the vertex search, where we've had quite a bit of success eliminating vertex search backgrounds, where both daughters have a hit in the first SVT layer, so these are shorter lived A prime, and we're still working on backgrounds for the other samples where there's a potential to increase the signal yields by roughly 50%. So you can see combined, we're beginning to approach expecting one event uh, already in this small uh, 2016 data sample. We're now preparing a PRD to fully document the analysis uh, techniques prior to diving in uh, fully into the 2019 analysis. Um, but just as important, the 2016 results form a more mature basis for estimating the reach of the future data sets, which is something I'll be talking about in a couple of slides here. Um, the other area of progress, of course, um, is uh, preparing for the 2019 analysis, the calibration and reconstruction of that 2019 data. With preliminary uh, alignment of the SVT and calibration of the ECAL, we realized about 90% of our expected vertex resolution improvement from the SVT upgrade. So you can see here, again, the baseline SVT has a resolution about twice uh, twice as bad as the, the goal with the upgrade. And with preliminary alignment, we've achieved about 90% of that goal. Uh, we've confirmed increase, the increased trigger acceptance from the positron trigger. So uh, here's the ESUM distribution, it's a critical kinematic distribution. It's very distinctive for tridents as opposed to backgrounds. So this is the E plus E minus energy sum. And you can see positron only triggers that have no uh, no cluster in the in the ECAL for the electron side. Um, and we've made a lot of progress towards the final energy and momentum resolution, where we're, uh, where you can see here the full energy electron uh, energy in the ECAL and momentum the SVT, and then an electron plus BREM, uh, uh, momentum plus energy sum peaking near the beam energy. Um, we're planning for first results from 2019 prior to our scheduled run next year. We do have a run scheduled next year. Uh, which brings me to the topic of optimizing the future run plan. So first of all, the assumptions. Currently, as of today, there are 135 pack days remaining, but that includes 58 days that are scheduled on the floor already in 2021. So if we take all of this time, we assume three total run periods with one pack week needed for commissioning each. That gives us 16 weeks of live, useful luminosity. 
So then we want to use existing Monte Carlo detector models uh, uh, at 2.3 and 3.7 GeV to figure out how to best divide that total of 16 weeks between operation with one pass, roughly 2 GeV, and two pass, roughly 4 GeV beam. Um, and then the questions are how best to divide the time between one pass and two pass operation. So you see here, um, if you take the 16 total weeks, uh, if you run at 2.3 GV between about six and eight weeks and the rest of the time at 3.7, you maximize uh, the, the sensitivity area, which we measure here by the excludable area um, between six and eight weeks at 2.3 and the rest at 3.7. The second question is how does the reach grow with the total run time, does the reach saturate? Because we know that if we run a very long period of time at a single energy, that excludable area stops growing. You basically saturate your reach there. And what we find is running it at just these two energies, uh, balanced between 2.3 and 3.7, uh, all the way out to 20 weeks, um, the area in which we have sensitivity continues to grow roughly linearly. Um, so we, we actually aren't close to saturating our, saturating our reach with only these two energies. So based on this, our tentative plan is to run in 2021 um, as planned at 3.7 GV for four weeks of data, and then to have two future runs, uh, 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 another run about six weeks at four GV, and then a run at about two GV for six weeks. So the reach projections uh, for this uh, run plan, uh, these have been updated based on experience with the 2016 analyses and using these 2.3 and 3.7 GV beam energies. So the 2019 data at 4.5 GV uh, begins to open up a window of sensitivity here, as you can see. The 2021 data, uh, adding that in, um, increases the area of sensitivity by a factor of 2.4. And then the full run plan, as I've just described it, uh, including 2019 and 2021, more than doubles this area again. So the run plan optimization is, of course, ongoing, and it depends on the availability of specific energies, which can affect uh, you know, the shape of this exact uh, excludable area. So in summary, uh, thermal relic dark matter in the MEV to GV range is motivating a worldwide search program for dark photons. Um, I've got a little bit of information in the backup about other experiments in this area and what they're planning. We can talk about that if you want. Uh, HPS has unique capabilities to search for dark photons with masses and couplings of particular interest for thermal relic dark matter. Uh, starting with opportunistic engineering runs in 2015 and 2016, HPS has used 25% of its allocated running time, uh, developing and refining the experiment and the analysis techniques, and collecting data with new sensitivity in 2019. The rest of the previously approved running time will provide sensitivity to dark photons over an ever-broadening range of masses and couplings. Obviously, we ask that that previously be ru approved running time be reapproved here. Um, although it's not part of the original proposal, so it's a bit of an aside, HPS also has sensitivity to other dark sector scenarios, for example, uh, strongly interacting dark sectors, so-called SIMPs, beginning already with the 2016 data set. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. So we now have time for questions. Uh, the reader of this experience is Xu Fang Su, so uh, please, Xu Fang, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, thanks for the nice talk. Very clear. And I do have two questions. So one is, uh, so, so, so you show us a plot which shows a comparison of the HPS reach compared to the other experiments. But there are also other future experiments. Thank you. You know where I'm going to. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the, the future, yeah, I just don't want, want to see a reach, you know, compared to the phases and the, you know, the other and the, okay, cool. Okay, let me see. So the, the dark green is the HPS. So and, this is, uh, yeah, this is the projection for HPS. Um, mm -hmm. So here's the projection from LHCB for their current data, and then you can see the results they actually got. They had some unexpected long-lived backgrounds that affected that. Mm -hmm. um, here's what they expect from uh, the, the D-star region. Um, Assuming, again, zero background, the backgrounds for this are still, I would say, unknown, so it's, it's, it's not clear, especially in this long-lived uh, part of the reach, uh, how this will play out, where it will open up first, and, and how much this will fill in uh, once they have their data uh, in a few years. And then you can see from the European strategy update, these are lines for phaser with run three, phaser all the way out through high luminosity LHC, uh, NA64, and also SHIP. Mm -hmm. 
I see. So uh, let me see. So so given all those, uh, looks like there's a still unique windows for the HPS to play. There's certainly the a of that all of these experiments achieve their goals. Um, mm -hmm. And in particular, it's between uh, the D star D mass difference and the dimuon mass threshold, uh, mm -hmm. where um, LHCb has been working the last few years to try to come up with something, and so far has not successfully identified. Uh, any way that they can get into this region. So uh, obviously our run plan, you know, we're thinking about uh, making sure that we cover as much of that as we can. Mm -hmm. Okay, but those are for the, uh, that green circle is for the displaced vertex search, right? So yeah, for the res resonance search, it will be pretty much covered by the other. I think the resonance search is pretty much assumed by other experiments. Mm -hmm. uh, in left, for example, we made some kind of concerted effort to reconfigure the experiment to do something like go after X17. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I don't think, uh, you know, this has always been, uh, you know, the, the primary goal of the experiment where the res resident search has kind of just been icing on the cake. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Yeah, and uh, my second question is actually about the, the 4GEV versus 2GEV one, because it looks like the, the slides you showed with the number of weeks assignment, it's different from the document I received, which is the HPS update, the, the, the one that was passed on to us. So, yeah, well, yeah. Uh, well, was it changes over there and why there was a difference? It's different by one week. Um, so we did this optimization exercise after writing that document. And what the document is actually a shift of one week. So here what I say is, you know, four plus six plus six, that would correspond to choosing this optimum. Uh, what's mm -hmm. in the document is different by one week. Right. Split. Mm -hmm. So, okay. you know, I mean, the reality here is until we know exactly what these energies will be, um, you, you really don't know, pardon me, um, you really don't know exactly uh, what these regions are going to look like and how they're going to merge. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I think I'm good. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Then uh, that concludes uh, this open session. Now we are still running late, obviously. Um, let me make the following suggestion. I expect that the uh, committee will need something like 40 or five, 45 minutes to uh, finalize our deliberations. Um, so let's uh, set a quarter past the hour as the hopeful time for the closeout. I don't know, uh, Lorelai, could you post a, a message to that effect uh, on that uh, page? Sure can. And uh, I cannot guarantee, obviously, that uh, we might have a further delay, but we will not start the closeout before a quarter past. And if by uh, that time we see that we are still having a delay, that will be posted. So uh, the PAC now reconvenes in the closed session room. Thank you very much to everyone. Thank you. <laughs>